The following program was sponsored by friends and partners of the Lift Up Jesus Ministry. You might be here today and you've made a thousand mistakes and you've made a thousand wrong decisions and you've done a thousand things that you shouldn't have done. But I'm here to tell you today that there is still a pathway for you to be pardoned. There's a pathway for you to get out from underneath that guilt. There's a pathway for you to start anew. There's a pathway for you to be set free here today. Welcome to Lift Up Jesus with Dudley Rutherford. I'm Kayla Francis, and I am so glad you've chosen to tune into our television program today. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever visit Southern California? If you do, consider this a personal invitation to visit us here at Shepherd Church. You'll meet some amazing people, and it would be an honor to have you drop by. But let's get right to today's message, because I believe it's a word you need to hear right now. So grab your Bible, your notes, and a pen, and let's listen to today's message. I want to speak to you on the subject of making your past history. Making your past history. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Our lives today are the manifestation of choices that we've made in our past. Many of us have poisoned our future due to decisions we've made in years gone by. And in this series, we want to take back what the enemy has stolen from us. And I'm sure like you, a lot of us wish that we could go back in time. How many of you would like to go back in time and redo some things? But we all know here today, you cannot turn back the hands of the clock. And so part of this series is trying to heal our past wounds. It's a process, it's a difficult process for some, but it's a journey that is necessary because again, we're never gonna reach what God has called us to be until we learn to let go of some things in our past. The Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 12 verse one, Let us throw off everything that hinders. We always talk about the sin in this verse, but it says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily, what, entangles and allow us to run with perseverance this race that God has called us to run. And so it starts here today, right now, understanding what God says about our past and how to let go, and how to start over, and how to put the past in the past. We've got a whole barrel full of issues that haunt us. Sometimes it's just past failures. Sometimes it's certain things that we are addicted to that just keep us from moving forward. There are abuses that some of us have experienced which come in different forms that can easily scar you for the rest of your life. Then there's this thing called toxic relationships or codependency. When someone else has controlled much of your life and you feel fearful of from ever being able to be set free. And then of course, there are wrong decisions or what we would call sinful behavior. Whenever you're engaged in sin, That's 100% on you. You can't blame anyone else for your sins. But because of any and all of these issues, I just want you to know that here today, God still desires to see you rise above any of those issues. God desires here today to heal your pain and to set you free and to cover you with joy and allow you to breathe deeply and fully and to know without question that he still loves you and to see you unchained and unbound from the weight of your past so that you can live a life of audacious faith can someone say amen Amen. 
So today, in your outline, I've got two major areas of study. The first is the trouble of our past. The trouble of our past. And what we call the weight, because it's heavy. The weight of guilt and shame. Many of us, not all of us, but many of us live under a cloud of shame and condemnation. The Bible says in Genesis 1.27 that God created us in His image. And of course, here on this earth, we're supposed to reflect the holy God that we serve. And He uh, created us to be vessels that would bring glory and honor to Him. However, anytime we choose to sin, anytime we choose to disobey, he's, He put this thing within us. It's like a safety gauge. It's called a conscience. And a conscience is this little warning system, like a little bell that goes off. And when that alarm system goes off, it's not a yield sign that says continue on. No, it's more of a stop and turn around sign, change directions. I drive what's called a Ford Explorer, and it has all these little warning lights that come on whenever something's wrong. And I'm, from time to time, it scares you. And they've got this thing on a Ford Explorer. I might be adjusting my radio or maybe grabbing a sip of water. And the entire steering wheel vibrates and buzzes. And a light comes on that says, keep hands on steering wheel. <laughs> now, just so you know, when I'm adjusting the radio, I'm not doing it with two hands. I, I'm, I have one hand on the steering wheel. I'm just kind of reaching over. And the whole thing starts vibrating, and it says, keep hands on the steering. How do they do that? <laughs> but my question to you is, are those warning signs a good thing or a bad thing? Are you sure? That safety alarm, is it trying to keep me from having a good time? Or is it there to ensure that I'm alive? Well, the latter, of course, is true. Likewise, whenever we sin, whenever we disobey, there's this sense of guilt, there's a lack of joy, there's a lack of peace, there's times you can't sleep at night. Those are all warning signs, and the signs uh, yell this, hey, put God, let God's hands back steering your life. Let God lead your life. The problem is when we fail to heed the warnings and continue to live destructive lives. The irrefutable weight of guilt and shame sets in and can lead you to a point of even greater despair and maybe even further depression. Now all sins, everybody say all sins. They all start out small, just a little compromise here and there, just a little misdeed here and there, just a little misstep here and there, but it grows. And if it left unchecked until eventually it destroys our life. James says in James 1.15, sin when it is full grown, it leads to a thing called death. We allow and accept little arguments and disagreements in our marriage, and if left unchecked, eventually it can grow to where our marriage falls apart. We accept and allow little moments where we swear and curse, and eventually we can't talk without swearing at all. We allow and accept little views of pornography, until eventually one day we are addicted to pornography. We allow and accept little bits of recreational drugs until we become full-fledged drug addicts. We allow and accept little bits of self-promotion and self-adoration until eventually we're so full of self and pride that we no longer need God in this life. And all of that comes with some measure of guilt, but the dangerous place to be is when you live with so much guilt, and I want you to write this down, where eventually you reach a point where you feel as though there's no pardon. More times than we can count, the weight and the guilt grows to a point where we think God can never forgive us for what we've done. And we all go through times where we disappoint those that we look up to, maybe a coach, a parent, a teacher, a pastor, a friend, a spouse. And there are times where we disappoint ourselves 
And we ask ourselves, how could I be so foolish? I've said things, I've done things that I simply can't undo. And then there are times where we know we've disappointed God, which is so deeply discomforting. But the worst feeling in the world is when you reach this point where you feel as if there's no pardon, that you've done something that no one will ever forgive you of, or that this mistake is so grave that you'll never recover from it. Perhaps the most dangerous position of all is when you no longer want to live because of your past mistakes, your past failures, your past experiences. But let me assure you here today that it's totally possible to be set free from your past and to live a life that is blessed, to live a life that is fulfilling, and to live a life that is joyful, and to live a life that is useful. Amen? Amen. You might be here today and you've made a thousand mistakes and you've made a thousand wrong decisions and you've done a thousand things that you shouldn't have done, but I'm here to tell you today that there is still a pathway for you to be pardoned. There's a pathway for you to get out from underneath that guilt. There's a pathway for you to start anew. There's a pathway for you to be set free here today. And that leads me to the second half of this study, which is the triumph over our past. And I want to spend more time talking about how do we overcome that past? Because there is a way to be set free from that guilt and that shame. It was Ezekiel who said, I will give them a new heart and a new spirit. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. That which we think cannot be restored can be restored in a heartbeat. You see, Satan comes along and his desire is to kill, steal, and to what? To destroy. Well, I ask, kill what? Steal what? Destroy what? His desire is to kill, steal, and to destroy your soul. So if you're here today and you're feeling as if there's no pardon, there's no way out, that comes from the devil. If you're feeling that, then everything is going according to the devil's plan. If you feel as though there's no way out from your past. Because God wants just the opposite. He wants you to know here today that regardless of what you've done in your past, there is a way out. Now there's a difference between guilt and shame. I want you to write this down. Guilt is when you think and say and believe, I did something bad. And you did. But shame is when you feel I'm a bad person. Guilt is a safety mechanism that God put inside of you. You should be thankful He put that in you. Shame, though, is an emotion that leads you to believe that you're worthless. Satan wants you to devalue yourself where God on the other hand places great value on you and he does love you no matter what you do he doesn't I want to make this clear he doesn't approve of any kind of sin and I think we as Christians we've justified too many things that we do saying well God loves me anyway he doesn't really care if I'm involved in these sins whether they be little sins medium-sized sins or gigantic sins and i just want you to know i want you to hear it that god doesn't approve of any kind of sin little sin medium sin big sin all sins god god doesn't condone any of that but god's desire is to cleanse you of that sin and to make you new again So there are, there are three windows that you have to look through clearly. Window number one, write this down, is the window of conviction. You have to reach a point where in the depths of your soul you are convicted that all sin is wrong. Disobeying God in any form is wrong pride is wrong living for self 
is wrong. Lying is wrong. Lusting is wrong. And you're never going to get out from underneath the weight of guilt and shame until you first fall under this conviction that God's way is the right way. So this verse, 2 Corinthians 7.10, you should all know this verse. Have it underlined in your Bible, star, asterisks, exclamation marks, fingers pointing towards it. It says that godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Guilt is actually a good thing if it leads you to repentance. Now, I've shared this with you before. Repentance is where if God's over here, you're, you're not living for God, and you're living for what I call the three S's. There's three S's, sin, self, and Satan. And every day of your life, you get up, and you're living for either sin, you're either living for self, or you're living for Satan. Repentance means that you turn away from sin. You turn away from self, you turn away from Satan, and instead of living for those things, you live for God. Jesus was the one who said in Luke 13, 3, unless you repent, you're going to perish. In other words, if you keep living like that, you're going to die. And so the worst place to be is where you're living in sin and there's no remorse. There's no regret. You're living a lie, and you're accepting that lie as normal. That's what's happening in the United States of America. We got people living in every imaginable way that goes against the things of God, and we're accepting those things as normal, and we are celebrating those things. Jeremiah 3, verse 3, God told Israel, you have the forehead of a prostitute. What does that mean to have the forehead of a prostitute? That means that you sin and you no longer blush over that sin. If you have any understanding of the holiness of God, if you have any understanding that God has called us to live a holy life because He's a holy God and He's called us to be a holy people, if when you sin, you don't have any remorse or guilt. It's, it's the worst place you can be. But if you do sin and you have this remorse, it's a good thing if it turns you back to following after God. You see, there's a net positive effect if you once again fall underneath the conviction of the Holy Spirit and you fall underneath the conviction of the Word of God and you fall underneath the conviction of God's calling upon your life, that guilt causes you to turn back to God. It said that godly sorrow leads us to repentance and motivates you to say, I don't want to live that life any longer. I don't want to be the prodigal son any longer. I don't want to be the prodigal daughter any longer. I don't want to live on the wrong path any longer. I, if there's a conviction that there's a difference between right and wrong, good and evil, righteousness and unrighteousness, conviction sets in and turns you back to God. Now, I, I just want to say this. There is a difference between godly sorrow and what we call general sorrow. Those are two different things. General sorrow comes whenever we face the sadness over the loss of something that we love. We grieve deep when we experience the death of a parent, the death of a child, the death of a friend. That's normal sorrow. But that's different than godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is when your heart is broken over your sin. And sin is simply, by definition, a lot of people don't know how to define sin. Sin is just, by definition, is missing the mark of what God's called you to live. Here at Lift Up Jesus, we want to take the truth of God's mercy to the four corners of the world through radio, television, and the internet. If you'd like to partner with our ministry, either through prayer or financial giving, 
please call the number on the screen below or visit our website at liftupjesus.com. It's our goal to reach as many people as possible with the gospel, which has the power to heal hearts and lives and save souls. We'd be honored if you'd join us in this mission. Thank you again for joining us today, and please tune in next week. And don't forget, wherever you're going and whatever you're doing, always lift up Jesus. So I grew up in Oceanside, California. I had both my parents. My dad was more so like a pillar in the community, helping the homeless, and my mom um, also helped a lot of people as well. And so when they saw us, they thought that our family was like the perfect family. It wasn't behind closed doors. My dad, he struggled with um, major addictions. And my mom, she had some sicknesses and some elements that were um, happening in her life that caused her to be unstable mentally and emotionally. So at times, I would um, see her be very angry, very angry towards um, my sister, um, in particular when she didn't have like certain medications. And I would see my dad using these um, particular drugs and we would try to stop him from doing that. It was very, very painful because I, I love my dad very much. and I love my mom very much. So to see them um, go through those type of um, strongholds and those type of um, things caused me to be unstable. So truancy officers would like come to my house to wonder why I wasn't going to school. Because at that time I was um, being also bullied and I was struggling academically. So I didn't want to be in the classroom. So I felt like I had no kind of like outlet to go. Uh, one day I was walking towards the gym in my neighborhood to go out to go dance and there was this young man that approached me and at this time I was like, you know, he seems like a nice guy and at that time I was like, it seemed like he was bringing me light um, when I was in darkness, but in reality he was a false light. The next day he said, I want you to meet me at this house and we're gonna, you know, go talk and things like that. For the first time in my life, like somebody sees me, somebody acknowledges me in the midst of the darkness that I was experiencing, in the midst of the pain that I was experiencing, seeing two of the people that I love most in my life struggled and battled to overcome their strongholds. That day, I lost my virginity on a bathroom floor, and it was the most horrific experience ever in my life, and it, it was terrible. He then began to um, take me into this room where there was like uh, five other men in there. And in that room, these men began to tell me to do certain things. They began to sexually abuse me. From that day, my life changed. I ended up um, getting pregnant. I got into this destructive relationship with this, um, this man. I got pregnant twice. Um, I ended up having um, two abortions and I felt so terrible about that. I was still drinking. I was still practicing um, other different things. I ended up in a car with these men. They were, we were all like drinking and smoking weed because that's how it went. You hang out, you smoke from the dawn up, drink from the dawn up to the dawn down. That's how my life was. So we were sitting on the side of this curb and um, I saw this car circle around. We heard gunshots, gunshots coming from the back to the front of the car. The person next to me um, got shot. The person in the back seat they were targeting got out of the car and they opened up the doors and he ran. I got out of the car and went underneath the car and these people shot and murdered the man right in front of me. And he looked straight at me and he walked away. That was the grace of God. That was God covering me. And there's been many dangerous situations that I got into where God has protected me and covered me from destructive situations like that. My younger sister would come in and she would tell me, she would say, do you wanna to go to church with me? Because at this time, my mom, she got very sick from kidney failure. It looks like it was coming close time to her passing away because she couldn't find a transplant for her kidney. She ended up um, passing away. 
And so my younger sister, she started going to church and she started really getting involved. And I was like seeing these changes in her. You know, I was seeing her, I was seeing a light upon her face. And when I saw that light upon her face, I was like, there's something different about her. In the fall of, of 2008, um, I went inside of the service, and the service was teaching a message on surrender and giving your life to Christ. And that day, I gave my life to God. And from there, my life has never been the same. I'm very happy to have my husband and my daughter because um, I didn't think that in those, none of those things were possible. So I didn't even think that I would get married, let alone have a daughter that I would have to be an example to, that I would have to fight to stay out of that lifestyle that I once was living in. Now I no longer have to fight to stay out of it because I accepted God's grace for my life. And when I surrendered my life, that's when God brought my husband and he brought my daughter in. I was attending church and the sermons that he was teaching was on grace, that his grace abound more than anything. And that's why when uh, Pastor Dugley, he focuses on the grace of God and being saved by grace. And I had to really nail that into my mind and I always felt like I was in condemnation to my past or I was in condemnation to my circumstance. But I, when I saw that the love of Christ, the love of God, what He did on the cross for me, what He did on the cross for us, you don't have to go through trials in order to accept God's grace. You don't have to go through drug addiction in order to accept God's grace. That just so happened to be my testimony, but it doesn't have to be yours. And for anybody watching, if they feel like they're not loved, if they feel like they haven't, that life hasn't dealt them what they thought it should, I will begin to look at Jesus, begin to look at what He did on the cross, because what He did is far better than what we can ever imagine, far better than what we could ever have in life. The life that He offered me today is far better than I ever could thought it would be. He changed me, He transformed me, and He brought me from darkness into light. Research proves that it's the regular hearing and teaching of the Word of God that takes our Christian life to a new level. That's why we invite you to meet Dudley Rutherford every week on this station for another powerful message straight from the Bible. You can also visit liftofjesus.com to sign up for our monthly email devotional, discover Pastor Dudley's books and other resources, and see our national TV and radio schedule. And don't hesitate to reach out on the phone or online. Pastor Dudley has a passion and vision to reach more people with a message of hope. And if you'd like to partner with us to touch the world, we'd love to hear from you. Your financial gift will do so much to help us impact the nations for Christ. And if you're ever in the Southern California area, we invite you to visit us at Shepherd Church here in Los Angeles. It's an amazing experience you'll never forget. Until next time, remember to always lift up Jesus. The preceding program was sponsored by friends and partners of the Lift Up Jesus Ministry.